right, uh, up here in a second here, we have Mr. Calvin Hedler. He is, uh, you know, he's going to talk about the internet. And uh, he's, uh, let's see, things I've learned. Not from New York City. It was the only city I asked if he was from. And uh, he's got a PhD in underwater basket weaving. So thanks a lot, Calvin. Sorry, give me one minute here. I'm still... All right, you guys should be able to hear me now. Bear with me for one second. My computer is not cooperating entirely yet. Alrighty, sorry about the delay. Uh, so if you are here, uh, you are about to be regaled with my talk, which is about real world red teaming. This is all the concepts that you don't get from textbooks or from classes when you're learning about hacking, when you're learning about penetration testing or red teaming. And I'm really giving this talk because uh, when I first got this job two years ago, I didn't know what I was getting into um, in any meaningful sense. I knew the basics of hacking. I knew how to use Nmap or Metasploit. I knew about the basic tools, but I didn't really understand how to put that together to perform a pen test, to perform a red team engagement, or anything of that nature. So I'm aiming this talk at people who are where I was two years ago, who want to get into uh, red teaming or pen testing, uh, but don't really have an idea of what that entails in the real world. Uh, so how many people here are in red teaming? Okay, cool, good number. How many people want to get into it? Awesome, well, this talk is for the people who want to get into it, um, and uh, yeah, I hope you guys learn some stuff from it. Uh, so as uh, ben said, I am Calvin Hedler. Um, I'm not from New York City. I'm from uh, Ann Arbor. I'm part of the red team at a company called Networks Group right in downtown Ann Arbor. Uh, we do assessments for companies of all sizes. Uh, if you see something you like about the methodology I talk about or how we perform our engagements during this talk, uh, feel free to hit us up. We have a booth. Um, we're always more than happy to talk about what we do, how we do it, and why it matters. And if you have Twitter, uh, you can find me at 001Spartan on Twitter. Um, I'm always happy to chat about hacking, pen testing, red teaming, uh, all of the above. 
So first I'm going to start off with kind of a textbook definition of hacking. This is the impression of hacking that you get when you are reading a textbook, when you're taking a class, when you're looking at tutorials online about how Nmap or Metasploit look, uh, operate. This is really what the impression you get of hacking. So that impression is that uh, hacking is a kind of linear process. It's one step after the other. You do this thing, then this thing, then this thing, and then you're done. Uh, and another thing is that hacking is all about exploiting vulnerabilities. It's about finding MS-08067 uh, on the network, or MS-09050, finding those using Metasploit to exploit them, and then you're done. Uh, and that's all that hacking is. Um, and another thing is that Metasploit, uh, Sorry, Metasploit. Uh, hacking is about uh, memorizing a bunch of commands. It's about knowing what each Nmap command does. It's about knowing, uh, you know, the exact syntax for um, Metasploit exploits or something like that. That that's the impression that a lot of people have of hacking when they're learning from classes because these books they're very good at giving you like recipes for things. They're very good at saying take these basic ingredients, mix them up a little bit, and you have a cake, right? But that's not how real-world hacking works. We need to learn to improvise. We need to learn how to take advantage of more than just, um, you know, these named vulnerabilities. If the only thing you know is how to use shell shock, then you're not going to get anywhere when you're trying to actually operate in a real environment, when you're trying to actually attack a real organization. So, uh, Textbook hacking, usually the first way that people learn about this, is that there's five phases. There's your recon phase, there's your scanning phase, there's gaining access, maintaining access, and covering your tracks. And the, those five steps are going to get you into any organization. Those are the five steps you follow no matter what you're doing. Uh, if you start at the beginning and you end at covering your tracks, you're going to win every time. That's what a lot of students are taught. That's what was pounded into me by a CEH textbook um, in school or, you know, when I read the poorly written articles by 15-year-olds uh, from Russia or India. That's what, that's the way it's described to a lot of newcomers and it's not really accurate. Uh, so, like, how do attackers gain access? This is the way that, again, textbooks show this this is what we do. That's how we're portrayed in textbooks, tutorials, um, classes. Uh, so first you run Nessus or Nmap and you find a vulnerability. You see MS-08067 and you're like, I know this. I can use Metasploit to exploit this. Just use SM, uh, exploit SMB, uh, uh, exploit Windows SMB MS-08067 net API. I've done that many times because that's always where people start. That's what you learn from the very beginning. It's about finding that one vulnerability and exploiting that. And then you gain access. You're like, cool, what now? Now I can dump password hashes. Great, I have passwords now. I can crack those, right? Then it gets a little fuzzy. It's what do you do after that? Uh, what are you really trying to accomplish? There's no point to this exercise uh, as it's taught. It's just about gaining access to a single system, and then you're done. But that's not really how things work. And that impression gives people, uh, it gives people a false impression of what we do and how to progress from there. They think if they know every single exploit out there, they're going to be the best hacker. They're going to pwn everything. They're going to be the leadest, right? And that's not the case. Uh, because in the end, why do we do this? You know, we, there has to be a point to this. Otherwise, we're just here making ourselves look cool and we're, you know, laughing at clients and saying, yeah, you're fucked. And that's not really what we, what the impression we want to give them. We need to do more because that's where the value comes in. It's, it's not in this stuff. That's not where the value is. The value is in demonstrating risk. And the way to do that is not by running a tool and then using another tool to exploit stuff. That's not where we demonstrate the risk. That's not why we do what we do. So, like I said, what do textbooks get wrong? Uh, this kind of five-phase attack pattern uh, chain of events it was okay back in 2010 or something before I actually got started in the industry um, because, you know, back then the perimeter was a little bit uh, less defended, you were more likely to see exploitable vulnerabilities on the network, internally or externally, uh, things like that. 
Uh, so Nmap and Metasploit aren't enough anymore when you're attacking modern environments. It's just not going to get you where you need to be in most cases. In some cases, sure, that'll work, but as defenders get more advanced, as they start to defend the perimeter more, uh, that kind of methodology is not going to work for you. Uh, also, Nessus is not a pen testing tool. Um, I hear this constantly. Uh, see it in job postings. Requires experience in Nessus to be a pen tester, and uh, I don't like that. It's a, it's a good tool for vulnerability management, but it always bothers me when people call it a pen test tool because it's really not. Um, that's just a pet peeve of mine. And then, like I said before, breaching the perimeter is just the start of the engagement. That's where you start. That's the basic part of where we start when we get an engagement. We're not just showing, yeah, I can bypass your firewall, or yeah, I can get onto one of your web servers. Where do we go from there? That's where the real juicy parts lie. And this kind of methodology, this five phase where you're doing your recon, you're finding an exploit, you're exploiting it, gaining access, that kind of stuff, it's not really how attackers operate. So I'm going to go into that a little bit more. Uh, like I said, just expanding on that, um, the, the way attackers operate, there's still that kind of attack chain, you're still doing your recon, you're still finding a way in, but then you're going through recursive cycles of that as you get deeper into the network. You're taking one attack chain to get in the perimeter, then you're chaining that with another, and so on and so forth until you reach your objective. It's about this recursive cycle of consistently analyzing where you're at, figuring out where you need to get to, and figuring out how to achieve that. And uh, so this really emphasizes something that I also like to point out when we're doing these engagements, uh, that defenders can't rely on an external perimeter anymore. It's not good enough, because attackers will breach that no matter what firewall you have in place, no matter how well you're monitoring your traffic. Def uh, attackers are going to find a way in. You can't rely on that perimeter. You have insider threats. You have um, phishing threats, uh, people walking into the building and plugging in. Uh, the the external network perimeter is not enough defense anymore, and I think uh, that this um, this textbook definition of hacking gives people the wrong impression, and that's why, partially why, I wanted to give this talk to help defenders out as well, because it's really an outdated method, a way of thinking, and um, the the more advanced uh, we can make ourselves as red teamers, uh, the better we can help serve the blue teamers who we're working with. <clears throat> so this is kind of a red team definition of what hacking is these days. Uh, so it's cyclical, like I said. It's about uh, you know not just chaining, not just attacking in one attack chain, but you're consistently recur uh, recursively performing these uh, steps in the attack chain to get to where you're going. And what it really is more than exploiting vulnerabilities, it's about exploiting assumptions that defenders make. It's about exploiting misconfigurations, maybe, not, vulner not named vulnerabilities, not CVEs. It's about finding those misconfigurations, finding those assumptions that defenders make, and figuring out how we can take advantage of that. And then, uh, lastly, hacking is about understanding technology better than defenders. Not every part of the tech stack, not everything in an environment, but the things we use to gain access and to maintain access to spread through an environment. We need to understand that a lot better than defenders do. Um, and the, the better we understand that relative to defenders, uh, the better we are as red teamers. The more access we can get to, the more uh, risk we can demonstrate to an organization. And that's really what it's about. Uh, so I mentioned that hack hacking is a very cyclical process. Uh, we got this nice uh, kill chain graph here from Microsoft that I think emphasizes that pretty well. Um, it's it's not just scan and exploit exfiltrate. That's you know there's a lot more in between those steps. There's a, a lot of recursion in there where uh, we're we're finding an issue, we're getting it onto the system, we're gaining more access from that system, and we go through the multiple attack attack chains through the course of an engagement. It's not just one attack chain um, and then we're done. At each step, as attackers, we have to analyze where we are. We have to say, okay, I'm positioned on this system. I have this level of access. I have these credentials. Where do I want to get to? What is really the important part for 
the, the client or for the target? What are they concerned about and how do I get there? So we have to take, take in that information, figure out where we are, identify where we want to be, and identify every step along the way of how to get there. And I think that's one of the core concepts that um, classes and textbooks get wrong because they, they teach you know five steps and you're done. So then you're lost once you get on a system. You don't know where to go from there necessarily. You don't know what, uh, what the next step is or how to get towards your objective from there. And that's why I try to emphasize that. So when uh, another important part that's connected to this kind of cyclical uh, model of hacking is that systems aren't just, they don't exist in a vacuum. They, you don't just see lists of systems as an attacker, or you shouldn't just see lists of systems as an attacker. When you run a port scan, each of those systems has a couple of ports open. Okay, maybe you can exploit something on there, maybe not, maybe you'll have to figure out another way to gain access to those systems. But uh, good attackers, when they're thinking about an environment, they take it as a whole. They see systems as a graph of interconnected attack surfaces. And that's where I think this quote by John Lambert from Microsoft comes in. And it's, defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs. As long as that's true, attackers win. And I think that really speaks to why we do what we do, because we see these things as graphs. We don't see a list of systems, a list of groups, a list of users, um, you know, a list of subnets or things like that. We see a graph of interconnected systems. That means that every system connects to every other system in certain ways or through another path. And if you land on the right system, if you get the right access, you can use that to exploit another system or you can get credentials for it that are valid on another system or you can pivot to a new subnet. And you really have to take in the environment as a whole. Nothing exists in a vacuum when we're performing these engagements. So I mentioned also that defenders will make assumptions, and as red teamers, we really need to exploit those assumptions. And some of these assumptions uh, are perfectly valid from a defensive perspective because they don't know any better, and that's why we do this, to help, to help teach them better when we're performing these engagements. So one of the things that defenders assume, and I will preface this by saying I have a lot of respect for those of you who do defensive work. I'm not trying to say that all defenders make these assumptions. Um, and also, defense is a hard job, so I'm under no illusions as to that fact. Uh, and so these assumptions are not blanket statements, but we see these assumptions a lot, and it's en regular enough that I wanted to call them out. Uh, so one of the biggest things we see is that defenders will assume that a breach is, uh, that the effects of a breach are limited to a single system. That's kind of the, the response we get when uh, defenders see malware on a system. They're like, okay, a user clicked a bad link, it dropped malware on their system. I'm just gonna re-image that system and then we're good, right? And that's not the case if you're facing a determined adversary. If we're emulating a real attacker, we're not gonna stop at that one system. We're going to take that access, move to another system as quickly as possible. So by the time the defenders have already, um, have re-image that system, we're already on another system and they have no idea about it. So defenders really, in, in a lot of cases, make that assumption that when a single user gets breached, when a single user clicks on a bad link or we manage to get into a single system, uh, the effects are limited to that system. And that's a fatal assumption in many cases because the defenders, uh, the attackers have already moved on from that. Uh, Defenders also, in many cases, assume that attacks happen from the outside. They happen from the external perimeter, um, that nobody can get past our firewall because we're using the latest and greatest. We've got, you know, we spent $4 million on this firewall, and it's the, it's the best thing. It'll make coffee for us when we're in the data center. Um, it, it's pretty much the greatest because it uses artificial intelligence or machine learning or whatever the hell it uses. And they assume that nobody can get past that perimeter. And as a red teamer, I just hop over the fence. I don't even bother going through the wall. I just find another way in, or I'm already inside uh, the perimeter through phishing or something like that. So making that assumption that all of these attacks are gonna start with like scanning the outside of the scope or um, attacking from the outside, finding a vulnerability on the external attack surface of the organization is a fatal assumption. 
Uh, and also, uh, a lot of admins like to have certain systems that, you know, it's their dirty little secret. It's a system that's configured to allow anyone domain, uh, anyone local admin, admin privileges because, you know, users really need to use this one piece of software on this system and it doesn't really like running as a normal user. So we'll, we'll just give everybody local admin on this system and nobody will figure that out. Like it, it'll, it'll just work and we won't have to worry about it again. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's for business purposes. Nobody will find it. It's this one isolated system. It's fine, right? Uh, and then they also assume that when they're responding to an incident, nobody's watching over the shoulder. Uh, often when we are on an engagement and a, our target notices our activities, um, we, we will s watch as they respond. We'll read their emails. We'll see their chat logs. We'll see them change their passwords and we'll grab those passwords as they change them. You can't assume that nobody's watching you when you're responding to an incident because if you do that, then we're just looking over your shoulder. We're like, okay, you changed your password one to password two. All right, I got that. And then, uh, you, you know, you shut down this system, but you left this up and we'll just get into that. We can watch as you figure out, um, you know, how to respond to this incident and we can take steps to respond to that in turn. So we can watch you as you're going through your incident response process, figure out what you're not looking at and then go for that. And then, Another d assumption that a lot of defenders make, uh, partially because sometimes they have to because they don't get access to anything outside of network resources or um, server infrastructure, is that network security exists in a vacuum. That if I defend my network really well, if I make my network as, you know, if it's impossible to get into, uh, nobody will ever be able to access these systems. And that's not the case because if your network security is in good order, we will break into your facility and we will get on a user system or we will fish a user because phishing will always work and uh, it's just a fact of life that phishing will eventually succeed uh, if you give it enough time, if you devote enough resources to it. And that's, that's something that you can't take in a vacuum, like I said before. Uh, network security is intrinsically linked to social engineering. It's linked to physical security. You have to take all of those together to improve your security posture. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to defend everything. So I wanted to describe a little bit about how we actually operate in the real world, what steps we take when we're doing an engagement, how we uh, go through the process and um, you know, go through the steps uh, to uh, go through the recursive attack chains to figure out how to get to an objective. Um, so first, when we do a red team engagement, we start with an objective. We ask the client, what are you concerned about? What data are you trying to protect? What systems are you trying to protect? What would be scary if you saw it posted to WikiLeaks? And that's that's important because that will tell you as a red team what your objective is. You need an objective when you're starting this. Our objective when we're doing an engagement is not to find every possible vulnerability in an environment. We will use what we need to to get to the objective and if we see other things along the way we will make a note of them but we don't give you a list of scan output. We don't give you a Nessus report when we're doing this because that's not the point. The point is to demonstrate how a real adversary would attack your network. And so there are a couple steps um, that I'm going to go through that really emphasize these points. Uh, first, how do we bypass the perimeter? Uh, and then we, we always try to hide in the, the network traffic. We always try to hide in the noise that's on every single network when we're doing this. And uh, the third point is that when we're hacking, we don't really use exploits as such in many cases. We don't need to. Native functionality and other things that we can make use of are going to be much more effective and harder to defend against and harder to spot. And then lastly, there's no tech hacking. That's where you know we walk into a building and we ask for access. We fish somebody for their credentials. Um, that doesn't really require these hardcore technical skills. If you can just walk into a facility, grab the data you need and walk back out, that's just as much of a risk as somebody who's sitting behind their keyboard, you know, with five different monitors, uh, typing Metasploit commands as fast as their fingers can go. Um, it's just as effective to use no tech hacking in many cases. 
So I wanted to dig in a little more about these points. Uh, first, bypassing the perimeter. Like I said, if we're attacking the external surface of an environment, a lot of the time, defenders have that pretty well locked down. So we'll go more towards phishing or uh, social engineering in many cases, because that gets us around that perimeter issue. It gets us through into an inside perspective when that lands. When we have credentials, then we can use those for a VPN, or when a user runs our payload, then we're running as that user, and we're inside their network without having to actually exploit a you know, SQL injection or finding a vulnerability on their external attack surface. And I think that's something um, that a lot of defenders uh, overlook, because once we're inside that perimeter, it's a soft, squishy target. They aren't really concerned about what happens after that point, and they need to be. Uh, another thing, uh, hiding in the noise. Like I said, we like to use normal traffic types. We use real HTTPS traffic. We use real DNS traffic. If we're looking, uh, if we're using these real traffic types, it's not going to look uh, anomalous. You're not going to see port 4444 uh, talking out to the internet or things like that. Um, and so we hide in these real traffic types. We use payloads that will talk uh, in, that will emulate behavior that a user might actually do. It might not perfectly emulate it, but um, it, it allows us to hide in normal network traffic. And then lastly, a lot of the time we don't need exploits. And what I mean by that is we don't need uh, tools to take advantage of like CVE scored vulnerabilities or um, things like that. We don't need to use shell shock to get into a server all the time because we can just use credentials that we've stolen previously to access it. We don't need to use um, you know, the latest Eternal Blue exploit because we can gain access through uh, stolen credentials or through native functionality of Windows. Uh, if, you know, if, if we steal credentials, we're already in a place to do that. We don't need to bother with these noisy exploits that might fail or might crash a system or things like that. And so then, uh, once once we have that foothold, we, like I said, we'll take advantage, advantage of features, misconfigurations, assumptions that defenders make, and then we'll use these trust relationships to gain more control within the environment, to escalate our privileges within the environment. Um, and w by doing this, we can leverage a single foothold system into basically complete control over the target uh, environment, like domain admin, enterprise admin. We can leverage these trust relationships uh, which I'll talk more about later, um, into complete control. And then we can use that to achieve our objectives, whatever the objective might be. In some cases, that objective is to get domain admin or enterprise admin. In other cases, that's to demonstrate that we can get uh, PHI, PII, so health information or uh, you know address, social security number, things like that. It, it depends on the engagement, what data we're going for, um, whether it's credit cards or whatever else. Uh, so I wanted to expand more on what I mean by bypassing the perimeter. So these days, a lot of organizations are looking at that perimeter pretty well. It's a pretty well understood attack surface in many environments outside of the crazy huge enterprises with 50,000 devices on the open internet. Um, so the perimeter is pretty well understood in many cases. It's uh, It's been emphasized for so long that organizations are more likely to have that locked down, to know what services are allowed out, to make sure that um, you know their firewall is adequately uh, protecting their web servers. They've got a WAF in place to detect SQL injection or things like that. In many cases, the perimeter is not the best place for us to start. So by phishing, we can bypass that entirely. Phishing is not blocked by firewalls. Uh, in most cases, our stuff is not caught by spam filters. Um, and we can land emails in a user's inbox pretty, pretty confidently. Usually we're pretty assured of at least landing in a user's inbox. And then with the right pretext, we can have the target employees give us access. They'll give it to us whether they know it or not. And with phishing, uh, it, it lets us very quickly turn an external attack into internal network access. Because if we steal credentials, we can use those credentials to log into the VPN. If we download a pay, if we have a user download a payload and run it, then we have a shell on that system that we can use to pivot. And 
finding ways to bypass the per, the fortified outer perimeter of a network is really one of the key points that I think a lot of textbooks and classes miss. Excuse me. Uh, so like I said, we also like to hide in the noise because trivial, uh, because um, arbitrary TCP connections over port 4444 are one of the biggest indicators. You know, every firewall out there will pitch a fit if they see that um, because, you know, that's the classic sign of somebody hacking. You see a connection that shouldn't exist. It's random TCP traffic. Uh, it's, it's not HTTPS. It's not SSH. It's not any one of the legitimate traffic types that you expect to see leaving your network. So your firewall will pitch a fit. It'll say, hey, you really need to look at this. There's some serious shit going on right here. And one of the things we notice about that is that defenders usually aren't looking at traffic types like HTTPS. They aren't looking at things like DNS. And even if they are, we use valid HTTPS traffic. We use valid certs. We use um, you know, these ordinary traffic types, and our command and control traffic hides in that. Our command and control traffic looks like somebody browsing a website. It might not be a website you're familiar with, but it looks like somebody browsing a website. Even if you have SSL interception turned on, it's still legitimate HTTP traffic. And identifying that is very tricky in most cases because defenders aren't looking for that. They're not inspecting that traffic closely. They're not looking for anomalies in their baseline uh, network traffic. They're not understanding that we can talk out over HTTPS as, as easily as Google can. And it's really hard for them to see when we use these legitimate traffic types. And they need to be aware that attackers are using that, that this is a real attack vector that uh, you need to be aware of and you need to respond accordingly. Your threat model can't be based around network-based detection because you're not going to see us on the network. And so I also mentioned that uh, hacking doesn't require any exploits. It doesn't, uh, if we can't rely on finding exploits to reach every objective in an environment. We can't say, okay, I got in with this single exploit. I got in with uh, MSO 9050 on this system. Now I'm just going to use that everywhere to gain access to the other systems I want to attack. That doesn't happen. We don't see uh, any situations where every single device that we want to gain access to is vulnerable to the same thing. We don't see that every single device we want to gain access to is even vulnerable to any network exploits. If they're keeping their environment up to date, they're patching things on time, uh, they're, you know, they're protecting things, um, or they're keeping with the update cycles and making sure they're not using outdated software, you aren't going to see network-based exploits unless you devote a ton of time to finding ODAs, and we don't have time to do that. So we like to rely a lot on using native functionality. Uh, we don't need to use these exploits if we can use uh, mechanisms like PSExec or WMI or RDP or all of the above. These are native features built into Windows that we can use to gain access uh, to systems. And it doesn't look out of the ordinary because a lot of the time these things are in use legitimately in the environment. And if you're not looking very carefully at these events in your environment, uh, you're in trouble because attackers are going to make use of them. And uh, another thing about that is identifying trust relationships within the environment and taking advantage of them. And so I'm going to explain what the what I mean by that. Uh, and the tool that we've been using a lot recently to take advantage of that is Bloodhound, which is a great tool, and uh, you should definitely check it out. Even if you're a defender, um, it's a great tool to run in your own environment, and I'm going to go into that more in a little bit. Uh, so what are trust relationships? Trust relationships are anything that says that this user is a member of this group, or this user has local admin privileges on this system, or this group has uh, admin privileges across these systems, uh, things like that. If a user has admin access to a system, what other access can we get from that? What trust relationships are there in that environment that we can take advantage of and use uh, to gain to reach our objectives? Uh, so one example is, does a user have admin access to a system that a domain admin is logged into? Because if so, we can log into that system and we can steal the domain admin's password because we have that local admin trust relationship between that user and that system. And 
the tricky part about this, uh, before Bloodhound was released, was identifying where users have access to. You'd use something like um, an SMB login scanner to tell you, okay, this user has admin access on this list of systems. And from there, uh, you know, you'd have to analyze what each of those systems contain on it, who was logged into each of those systems, um, you know, what each logged in user had access to, uh, from each of those systems, and it was a really time-consuming process. It was a really laborious process. It was a noisy process, and it wasn't very efficient. Um, and also things like, is the user a member of a group that can target a system that is that a domain admin is logged into? So if a user is a member of a group that has admin on a system, that's the same as the user being admin on that system. It's functionally the same thing. So we, we really like to emphasize this trust relationship thing because Active Directory is a great technology. It's really cool for managing all this, uh, you know, all these disparate systems and combining that functionality into one place. But at the same time, this gives an attacker uh, a very good way to take advantage of this centralized management to exploit the, um, you know, the, the intricate um, workings of this giant database to exploit systems in ways that defenders don't really realize are vulnerable. So, like I said, uh, when we're looking at these trust relationships, we'll use a tool called Bloodhound, and that's an example of a Bloodhound graph showing that, you know, users have admin to these systems, and these users share admin access to these systems. Uh, this user's logged into this computer. Um, this user's a member of the group, which is admin to this server. Uh, that a domain admin is logged into. It, it pops it up in a nice, pretty graph. It gives that to you, and you can query this information as a normal user. Uh, very recently, Microsoft has started implementing uh, things so that you can't tell who's local admin on a system uh, without a little bit of massaging. You can't tell that, you can't query that remotely over the network. But for most environments, we can do this as a completely unprivileged user. We don't need to be running as admin. We don't need to be a member of a privileged group. We can just query this information. And this will tell us exactly how to exploit this attack path. It'll say, if I'm starting at this node and I want to reach this system or this group, how can I get there? And it'll chart that out for you. And it's really useful, especially for defenders, because you can run this too. You can run this for yourself and see there's an issue here because all users are local admin on this one system. Or uh, as a normal uh, everyday user, as a normal um, you know, person in finance, I can gain domain admin control through this derivative chain of attacks through stealing credentials and logging into other systems. I can gain domain admin privileges as any user in my network. And identifying that was incredibly hard until this tool came out. I believe it was 2016 um, that Bloodhound came out. And if you haven't heard of it, if you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it um, because it's a great way to analyze what's going on in an environment and figure out what those attack paths are, how attackers can abuse trust relationships to gain the access they need to. And I put the GitHub link uh, down there so you can copy that down or just uh, take a picture of that if you really want to check this tool out later if you haven't heard about it. Uh, so another concept of this exploit-free hacking is lateral movement. And this is one of the biggest things that I see is not being taught in classes, that students don't understand when they're coming out of school and they're entering the real world. Lateral movement is one of the biggest things that attackers do. How do you take access to a single system and move to another system from that? And when I was coming out of school, when I first got my internship, when I first got this job, I didn't really understand that as well as I should have. And figuring that out is one of the most important things that you can do if you want to get into red teaming because gaining access from from an initial foothold is a, you know, it's an integral part of how to uh, achieve objectives in a network. And you really need to understand lateral movement and its many forms because you can do lateral movement with uh, PSExec, you can do it with WMI, 
You can do it with WinRM, you can do it with RDP, you can do it with DCOM, uh, you can do it with SSH. There's all of these really, uh, you know, core features of Windows that make it really easy for management, but also make it really easy for attackers to gain access to those systems. And because they're native Windows functionality, uh, in many cases, they're likely to be in use in the target environment. It won't. It might not look out of place to see WMI traffic. It might not look out of place to see PS exec events if the admin is doing things like that. In in some cases, it can be very out of place, but not all the time. So it's important to really understand your environment and uh, figure out what what method is best for lateral movement in that particular environment. And uh, w one thing I wanted to note here. Um, is RDP, it's not usually considered a lateral movement technique because it's not something that, you know, you can do built-in Metasploit to gain code execution. There's not just a series of commands that you can type to, uh, you know, pop a shell on a system via RDP. But logging into a system and pulling up the command prompt on that system is just as effective as using PSExec or WMI. And that's something that, um, you know, isn't really widely considered a lateral movement technique, but absolutely is, and it's often overlooked um, because of that. And another really interesting thing about these techniques, because they're core Windows functionality, because they're built in, you don't need an agent on the system. You don't need an interpreter. You don't need a Cobalt Strike Beacon. You don't need an Empire uh, shell on the system to take advantage of that in many cases. All you need is a command prompt or PowerShell or something like that, and you can make use of this. You can RDP to another system and do whatever you want to on that system. It doesn't rely on using third-party frameworks or dropping malware in an environment. You can perform an engagement entirely malware-free uh, just using this native Windows functionality. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it unless you're a masochist because uh, it's it's very painful to do, um, but it can be done. And I think that's a something that a lot of people don't really understand. And so I also wanted to talk about this idea of the credential shuffle. I did not coin this term. I don't remember where I first heard it, but it's this concept that um, really speaks to the recursive nature of these engagements because uh, once you're on a system, you have a series of objectives on that system. And uh, depending on what the system is, sometimes your objective is just to get more credentials to get more access. And so we go through this credential shuffle quite a bit during our engagements because we land on a system. We get credentials from that system. We use those credentials on another system. We get credentials from that system. We use those credentials on another system, so on, so forth. You know, uh, and it, it's just a way of expanding access given an initial foothold or given a, a set amount of access. We can use this um, this concept to recursively gain further access into an environment. And uh, I also recently worked on a tool to automate this process in the Cobalt Strike framework. Uh, this is a tool called Angry Puppy. It was created by myself and Vincent Yu, who's at BY Security on Twitter. Awesome red teamer from the UK. Uh, he's an excellent operator, and if you haven't checked out his red team, t uh, red team tips on Twitter, I highly recommend it because he's got a lot of really good information in those. There's a couple hundred of these uh, tips on Twitter that he posted, um, and I, I think he put them up on, a, on his GitHub since then. Uh, great resource if you're ever looking for more information on really expanding your level of tradecraft. Uh, so the Angry Puppy tool is a way to automate this credential shuffle in Cobalt Strike because Cobalt Strike exposes a lot of information to us as attackers. It's our framework of choice when we're doing red team engagements because it's powerful. Um, it's relatively easy to script these things and we can use it to gain a lot of access very quickly. So what it does is it ingests data from Bloodhound. We run Bloodhound when we land in, in an environment and we get this graph. We get all this information. And we, we load that information into Angry Puppy. And Angry Puppy will say, OK, I'm admin on this system, and I want to get to this system. And I have this attack path that shows me every single node I need to execute along that system. And this tool would not be possible without Bloodhound, without the work of the amazing people who write Bloodhound. They're way smarter than I am, way better red teamers. Um, and this tool wouldn't be possible without that. Uh, but it allows us to very quickly expand our access from a single system, from a single foothold, 
and get to the objective within minutes in many cases because we run Bloodhound, we take that data, ingest it into Angry Puppy, and then we get domain admin or we get to where we're going. And uh, the GitHub link for that is uh, right at the bottom of the slide there. So I wanted to put it all together using a kind of a case study. And uh, this was for a manufacturing company. Um, this was an engagement that we did a, a few months back. And we, they were really concerned about uh, seeing competitors stealing their parts, uh, mostly from overseas. But um, they, they were concerned about what a competitor could do if they gained access to their network. How easy was it for an attacker to get this data, steal it, and then reproduce this stuff? Uh, so we start, as always, by fishing for a foothold, and then we work on expanding our access. We want to get domain admin so that we have complete control over the domain, and then we can get to the important data. We get that, we, obviously in this case, the goal was to get at the goodies in the environment. And the goodies were uh, like CAD drawings or prototype uh, demonstrations, things like that. So. To start, we try to gather information. We look at their core business, their manufacturer. Uh, we look at their employees, see how many employees they have, who might be vulnerable to phishing attacks, where they work, um, what their business role is. We look at their partners. Who partners with them? Can we use that for a social engineering pretext? N maybe. Uh, and in this case, it, we, we were pretty confident that their security posture was not where it needed to be. So we chose a fairly uh, mundane Fishing lure. We chose a fairly, uh, you know, normal-looking attack. It's nothing state-of-the-art here, uh, but we targeted non-technical employees because technical employees are more likely to see phishing attempts. And so we we looked at like these the HR people or the the people who are actually doing this manufacturing stuff, and we targeted them with a phishing attack. And the pretext was that they have Microsoft Outlook updates that they can they can install on their computer. But first, we need to make sure their computer is compatible uh, by downloading the script and running it. And out of 10 employees that we targeted, uh, six employees ran the script and gave us access to their internal network. We completely bypassed the perimeter. And now we're inside their network. We're internal with the foothold. And the, the cool thing about this is that we don't even have to run a single scan. We don't need to run a noisy nmap scan against their external footprint because we're already inside. There's no need to be noisy if we can get inside with much quieter methods. So then we go through the credential shuffle. And this was before uh, we wrote Angry Puppy. So uh, we had to do this the manual way. It doesn't take too much longer, but um, Angry Puppy is just cooler because it automates it. And you just see all your access expanding um, in, in a matter of seconds sometimes. Uh, so our foothold systems, we didn't really have local admin access, so we had to find privilege escalation. In this case, I think it was a, a service a service path hijack where we were able to insert a payload into a service and then restart the service, so that gave us access as the local system. And then from there, we were able to steal the local admin password, and they had a shared local admin password, uh, so we were able to uh, utilize that shared local admin password and pass the hash without even cracking it. We cracked it as well, but we didn't even need to in order to gain access to further systems. Uh, but what we did do is we used Bloodhound to analyze which systems are important, which systems have high privileged users logged into them, which systems have users that we can use to get to other uh, servers. And this let us see where those users were logged in. It let us see where we had local admin access to. and we were able to use that shared local admin password to access those valuable systems and steal plain text creds from memory because Windows uh, 8 and below will store those plain text creds in memory unless you set a registry key. So we were able to steal those credentials and reuse them for our own purposes. So we stole these higher privileged uh, user creds and that user was a member of a group that had admin on a single server. The cool thing about that server was that there was a domain admin logged into that server. We don't know why, we just know that there was a domain admin logged in there. And since we have admin access to that server, we can steal his credentials too. So we just log on that server, we grab those credentials, and we now have domain admin privileges. 
And from there, we can use that access to spread to other high value systems. We can look at the finance people's systems. We can look at um, you know, their file sharing systems, their SQL systems uh, to gain whatever information we might be able to from there. And we utilize the domain admin credentials to get more domain admin credentials because we don't want to leave an easy way for uh, the defenders to get us out just by changing a password. We, we never want to limit ourselves to one uh, to one point of failure when we're doing this engagement. You never want to limit yourself to a single point of failure when you're uh, doing defensive work or sysadmin work. We never want to do that when we're doing red team work either. Uh, so then the goal was to get at important data because the client was concerned about their uh, sensitive information, their intellectual property. Um, so we identified file shares. We targeted the files that were on those shares, the CAD drawings, the um, demonstrations of prototypes, pictures of their manufacturing equipment. I don't understand most of what we got, but it was sensitive information because it was their intellectual property. This was the information that they're concerned about. And uh, we also managed to steal employee PHI or PII. This is personally identifiable information or personal health information. That's um, you know social security numbers, that's tax information, that's insurance claims. We managed to get the goods. And then we showed that an attacker could exfiltrate that data. We showed that with you know a small sample that we could take that data to our own systems without them noticing. And it was pretty easy to uh, you know give them a reason to care. We wanted to demonstrate why they should be worried about this happening, um, because otherwise we're just making them look bad for no reason. We don't want to make them look bad because. You know, our job is not to look cool. Our job is to demonstrate risk. And without getting this data and showing them how we got it, uh, they really aren't getting that. They aren't getting any value from you looking cool. Um, we need to show them why they should be worried about this stuff and why they should pay more attention to their security posture. And the, the interesting thing is that we were able to do this all before we, were, we went on site. So we went on site and we already had domain admin access because we you know, utilized this trust relationship uh, exploitation. We fished our way in. We didn't even have to log in. Uh, we didn't even have to arrive on site and plug into the network to gain domain admin creds. And that's really how a lot of attackers operate because most attackers aren't going to bother um, they're not going to bother going on site because it's a, a lot higher risk for them. So to wrap up, um, the reason I'm giving this talk is because red teaming is a very fast-paced field. The state of the art in the red in red teaming is advancing every single day. It's really hard to keep up with, and textbooks and classes can never keep up like that. They can never really prepare you for what you're going to face in the field. So you need to study up on this. You need to follow people on Twitter. You need to read blog posts and really figure out what the state of the art is and how you can emulate that. And hacking is no longer as simple as just scanning and exploiting. And I wanted to give a couple shout outs here. Of course, my employer networks group, they took a chance on a kid who hadn't even graduated college yet and let me do this shit for uh, for money, and I am very grateful to them for employing me. Uh, I wanted to shout out to Gurkhan because this is a great event. I've been coming here for four years now. I, this is my second time speaking. It's always an awesome time here, awesome people. Uh, I wanted to shout out Vincent Yu, my co-author of Angry Puppy, at VY Security on Twitter. Follow him if you uh, are a Twitter user. And also the Bloodhound team because that is one of the biggest paradigm shifts we've had as red teamers. Um, or as defenders even, to be able to analyze that trust relationship, interaction in an environment, and figure out what's going on. And I have a, a couple more minutes if anybody has questions, if anybody wants to uh, comment about the talk, has any questions that they'd like to go into further, I'm happy to entertain those for a couple minutes that I have left. So uh, the, the thing that's changed, uh, the question was, what's changed in the past year since I spoke here last time? What have I learned about how we operate? Um, the, the thing that's changed for me most is the, um, the emphasis on exploiting these trust relationships, on uh, using native functionality, on really um, not 
not being noisy and trying to emulate adversaries as they actually attack environments, trying to be as realistic as possible to provide the most value for our clients because if we're able to emulate real attackers, then we can demonstrate what their risk is in the real world as opposed to just a pen test where you know you scanned everything but you would have been caught five times uh, doing that. Any other questions? Sorry? Uh, so the question was, does Bloodhound have applications for non-Windows systems? And no, it does not. Um, you can run the, the client on non-Windows systems, the, the graphing visualization, uh, but it's really oriented at Active Directory environments, at collecting data from that, because uh, there, there are similar some similar things for uh, Linux or Mac systems, but nothing to the extent of Active Directory, and it's really oriented at that kind of um, enterprise that uses Active Directory as a core, as a core part of their infrastructure. Anyone else? Uh, so the question is, how do I feel about the term pen testing as opposed to red teaming? I'm guessing. Or oh, pen testing is two separate words. Uh, pen space testing. Uh, it pisses me off because it's pen testing one word or penetration testing, not pen space testing, not capital P E N testing. No. <laughs> Any other questions? Alrighty, well, uh, if there's no other questions or if you want to come up to chat privately after, uh, feel free to approach me. I am not going to bite. Uh, please feel free to ask me any questions on Twitter. Um, I'm 001 Spartan on Twitter. And thank you for coming to my talk, and I hope you learned uh, stuff.